Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Leanna, for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming out on a cool but pleasant day to talk about how people ate their way across the United States. We've all heard the aphorism attributed to Napoleon that an army travels on its stomach. Well, it more likely came from Prussian King Frederick the Great, who Thomas Carlyle in 1858 quoted as saying, an army like a serpent goes upon its belly. Whether a Frenchman or a German uttered the dictum, we all accept its truth. One must eat in order to travel. This fact is so obvious that we often take it for granted that sojourners had to eat and that consuming food shaped their travel experiences. Our shared chomping and swallowing only connect us to these past travelers. And they also tie us viscerally to all our foreparents. Everyone ate. U.S. Highway 66 connected Chicago on the Great Lakes and Los Angeles on the Pacific from 1926 to the 1980s. And it serves as an ideal location for examining how people ate their way across America. Virtually every traveler took home memories of meals on the road. Evelyn Tucker and a co-worker named Maud took a two-week vacation trip from Tulsa to California in August 1938. They drove straight through the first night, stopping for coffee breaks in Weatherford, Oklahoma and Shamrock, Texas. Munching on fried chicken that Maud had prepared in advance, they made their way across the treeless Texas panhandle. She reminisced. During the night after leaving Shamrock, there was a beautiful moon, and the road shined like a piece of ribbon in the night. About the chicken, she later penned, Maybe you think that didn't hit the spot? There's no need here to retell the story of U.S. Highway 66, but it's worthwhile for us to consider how people found sustenance as they initially began crossing the nation in automobiles. Many of these travelers and generations of their successors <laughs> brought food from home or purchased it at grocery stores along the way. Even eating just breakfast and lunch of the car could save an estimated half of meal expenses. But some very traditional travelers simply did not trust the cleanliness of roadside eateries. Even before Highway 66 was designated in 1926, many motorists like the family of Mabel Richards Phillips, who drove from Mississippi to California, carried staples from home, and as she remembered, purchased fruit and other snacks along the way. Leaving her to remember, <coughs> I ate enough cheese and crackers to last a lifetime. From a trip two decades later in 1939, B. Bragg reported, we packed 21 cans of potted ham, seven cans of tomatoes, and a can opener. 
through dust storms in Amarillo, a cold spell and gallop, and searing heat at needles, we were sustained. Viola Van Covering and her father drove the mother road in a Model A Ford in 1934. From this trip, she remembered most of the time we did not stop for lunch. Dad would drive for a while in the morning and then I'd take over. She further <coughs> added, while driving, Dad would hand me a sandwich. I'd take a bite and drink some water or milk out of a bottle that he'd hand me. Twenty-five years ago, Terry Ryburn reminisced about a 1953 trip her family made from Illinois to California in a pickup truck with a homemade canvas-covered camper. Meals had a comforting sameness along the road. Dad stopped at a grocery store each morning for a package of cinnamon rolls or donuts and half a gallon of milk. Lunch was a picnic, a hunk of bologna and bread to make sandwiches, milk, and if we were really good and Dad felt especially solvent, there might be cookies. Not all motorists who brought along their own food did so merely to save money or to feel comfortably self-sufficient. African Americans never knew what receptions they might find on the road. Although only two of the states crossed by the mother road had legally mandated separation of the races, everywhere else travelers typically encountered racial segregation by custom. By word of mouth, black motorists learned about such places as one in Rolla, Missouri that, that serves seated African Americans. A single designated table at the back of the bus station dining room. Starting in the 1930s, enterprising publishers like Victor H. Green began issuing guidebooks that identified eateries and lodgings that welcomed blacks. But these enterprises were exceptions to the rule. This is the Atlas Hotel in St. Louis. African-American travelers followed the same procedures as Irv Logan's family in Springfield, Missouri. He chronicled, you'd pack food because you wasn't sure where you'd find a place to eat. His friend Bert Adams seconded this remembrance by recounting, we would fry maybe a chicken or two and then have something on the side. That's what we used to do. George Culp, also of Springfield, related, what we would do if we was on 66, we'd go to the grocery store and buy minced ham and crackers and things like that. Musician Norman Jackson recollected that on the road between scheduled gigs, he and his bandmates would have what we called a group steak, explaining that this group special steak was bologna and crackers. Some of the more resourceful travelers who brought food from home or bought it along the way prepared hot meals at the roadside. Many of these sojourners also camped out, facilitating preparation of meals on campfires or portable stoves. Kenneth Estes of Springfield, Missouri stated, I remember my dad getting the fire started and we had a big skillet a big old cast iron skillet, and we made some fried potatoes. We didn't eat high on the hog, but we ate. Travelers found boarding houses scattered along the full length of Highway 66. These grassroots establishments, often housed in 
large former residences provided lodging and up to three family style meals a day for paying customers. Diners served themselves buffet style from bowls and platters on the tables at set hours. Many of these businesses catered to travelers and people like railroaders who worked away from home. Because these enterprises offered females employment that avoided censure from community members, many owners and operators were widows and other single women. The Whiteside Hotel and Cafe on Route 66 across from the train station in Grants, New Mexico exemplified this class of eatery. Lucy Jane Ross Whitesides came to the area from Joplin, Missouri sometime before 1910 with her husband who managed a ranch in the Zuni Mountains south of town. In 1919, an assailant murdered her husband, leading the widow with two daughters to move into Grants. Members of the local Masonic Lodge an organization known for its charitable works, erected for her a small hotel with kitchen and dining room, where Lucy Jane housed and fed both Santa Fe Railway trainmen and motorists on the National Old Trails Road, later Highway 66. Up and down the road, travelers knew her hospitality. The 1929 Hobbs Grade and Service Guide advised drivers that they could find, in its words, good 50-cent meals at Mrs. Whiteside's. The widow maintained the boarding house service until 1952 when she put up the more modern Cactus Inn Motel. Since 1954, the Mother Whiteside Memorial Library in Grants has perpetuated her name. During much of the year, roadside entrepreneurs open seasonal food vending stands all along American highways. Once they, often they, uh, they lived on farms through which the roadways passed. Although some of them hawked their fare from the sides of busy city streets. Perhaps the simplest form, vendors stood along the roadside holding samples of their gastronomic bounty. Robert Magnan's father planted a vineyard fronting on the mother road between Cuba and St. James, Missouri, where during August and September, each year his children peddled grapes to passing motorists. <coughs> this was accomplished, Robert wrote, by lining the kids along Highway 66, a hundred yards or so apart, and when a car appeared, we stood as near the highway as we dared and held up our buckets of fresh grapes. He remembered that when drivers groused at the 25 cent price being too high, he and his siblings would respond, 20 cents without the basket. <clears throat> One did not have to raise fresh foods to sell, as it took no more, <coughs> no more than a few bottles of soda water or fruit juice and a wash tub of ice to become a roadside cold drink merchant. 
the most conspicuous vendors on Highway 66 through urban St. Louis were its street-side pretzel vendors who for decades tempted motorists with salted twists of fresh baked dough. Elsewhere, some people just place signs on the highway facing windows of their homes to advertise homemade pies and cookies. Some roadside vendors showed creativity in constructing little wooden shacks, often with hinged flaps on the front, where they housed grills heated by burning wood, charcoal, or bottled gas. Most often they prepared toasted sandwiches and fried foods. <coughs> Here, <coughs> hamburgers and hot dogs abounded. Once westbound drivers reached Missouri, they started seeing roadside barbecue pits that continued across Oklahoma and into Texas. Here, people got up in the wee hours of the mornings to begin cooking their own selections of pork, beef, and poultry to draw in midday diners. Some of these enterprises continued sating the appetites of travelers for decades as happened at the Pioneer Camp Tavern on the north side of Tulane 66 at Wellston, Oklahoma. Here, Lloyd Swisher opened a campground and barbecue pit in 1929, with the business passing through several subsequent hands, all of them specializing in slow-cooked meats. Journalist Susan Croach Kelly died there in 1983, describing the camp as, in her words, a treat in mostly dry Oklahoma where you can get delicious barbecued rib dinners and a cold beer. In 1995, the Busca family purchased the stand, continuing the barbecue traditions in 2015, grandson Levi Busca, falling fire damage, reopened as the Butcher Barbecue in a new metal structure on the very same campground site. Basic cafes, lunchrooms, and diners were just a step higher in the pecking order of roadside eateries. They sold food and drink to customers beneath a protective roof and typically boasted of offering tables and seating. Most often, they had electrical lighting and in time, increasingly offered customers the use of sanitary toilets. Seating might include counters or tables with chairs. Some really basic outlets had rows of wooden chairs similar to those in stereotypical schoolrooms that were fitted with single, narrow, table-height, desk-like eating surfaces on just one side. Over time, these one-arm joints, as they were called, phased out the uncomfortable hard wooden seats with conventional tables and chairs, but some survive, such as at the Hot Wieners in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The emphasis in these elementary roadside eateries 
was in speed of service. But in time, some of them became known for the quality of their food offerings. A good example of this phenomenon blossomed in Santa Rosa, New Mexico, where Lou Cofton dined in July 1952. While driving solo from California to Quantico, Virginia to rendezvous with her husband, she began noticing some of the 26 wooden advertising billboards featuring the rotund face of a fat man grinning with satisfaction. The signage led her to pull into the big parking lot on one side of the club cafe where there another of the beaming faces smiled down. Inside the air-conditioned restaurant filled with red plastic upholstered seating, she struck up a conversation with members of a big Italian-American family headed the opposite direction toward San Antonio, uh, pardon me, toward uh, Los Angeles. They were concerned about my driving all this way by myself, but I told them I was okay. The friendly exchange continued through a tasty meal. Still concerned, the family, in Lou's words, ended up buying my dinner and wishing me well for the rest of my trip. Almost as a post postscript, she jotted down at her trip diary, the club cafe was rather large and nice with good food. Widow Mary Bell Epps established the eatery with the assistance of sons Charles and Newt in November 1936. She gave it the then fashionable name of Club Cafe. Well, we don't think of that very fashionable today. This was 1936, remember. At the time, many ordinary Americans viewed exclusive members-only country clubs as being elite institutions patronized by the rich and powerful. So they in turn gave ordinary cafes the club name to make them seem more alluring than they might otherwise be. The Epps family ran the roadside restaurant for the next five years. Longtime Santa Rosa businessman Adolph Serrano was there at the time, and he said, I remember that they had very good hamburgers and pie, and the pie was 10 cents a slice. In the meantime, daughter Ruby Mae Epps married Texan Floyd Shaw. They and another couple, Geraldine and Philip Neal Craig, purchased the business from Mary Epps and turned it into a roadside landmark. In stages, they expanded its size and food selections, making it preeminent among the sit-down restaurants of Santa Rosa. Club cafe men know their beefsteaks, proclaimed a 1950s menu which featured three particular Club 16 steaks, each one weighing a full 16 ounces. Sourdough biscuits freshly made using leavening of fermented dough saved back from previous bakings became so popular that eventually the Club claimed to have sold over two million of them. In time, Interstate 40 and 1972 bypassed the old road through Santa Rosa. The Shaws and the Craigs had sold the club cafe to others who struggled with reduced trade to keep the doors open. The last owner, Ronald P. Chavez, even broadcast live radio programs on KSYX AM radio just before mealtime at 6.30, 11.30, and 4.00 to lure motorists from the freeway on the old 66 and its eating place. Finally, in 1992, the club closed. 
New Mexico Highway Department crews saw down the last of the old billboards and the fat man smile no more. When motorists started taking newly designated Highway 66, a number of existing institutions were already profitably serving meals to travelers. From the days of horse-drawn coaches, a number of old stagecoach inns remained in business, mostly as boarding houses. Among these was the Black Host Pardon me, the Black Hotel, also known as the Old Stagecoach Stop, which survives today as a museum in Waynesville, Missouri. Their successors, I'm afraid this doesn't want to advance. We like this. Thank you. <laughs> Their successors were hotels. These more elaborate hostelries exploded in numbers across America in the 19th and first quarter of the 20th centuries. Most of them in time catered to those who traveled by train. But substantial numbers of motorists found their ways to them as well. Almost every county seat town in the nation claimed at least one or more hotels. Established that establishments that furnished short-term lodging on a paid basis. Hotels regularly afforded sustenance to transient guests and others. Food and drink service brought in as much as room rentals. So managers, like this one checking in a guest, gave food service very close attention. Virtually every hotel included some kind of formal dining room with table service and usually white tablecloths and napkins. Hotels likewise earned revenue from meal service in banquet rooms, or in spaces that they could adapt to that use. Everywhere that law permitted, these inns operated bars, sometimes called men's grills, with limited food offerings and ubiquitous drink. After enforcement of national prohibition began in 1920, these adjuncts typically converted into coffee shops. But after enforced sobriety ended in 1933, most returned to selling alcohol as cocktail lounges. Hotels tempted travelers with meals and beverages from Lake Michigan to the Pacific Shore. A typical Route 66 hotel with full food service was the Edwin Long, constructed in Rolla, Missouri in 1930-31. Although many travelers stopped off at lodgings fronting directly on the Mother Road, others preferred the comfort and security of traditional hotels usually found in downtown commercial districts and within walking distance of train stations. For decades, a stream of motorists sought food and lodging as night fell in Rolla by heading toward the red glow of hotel in big red neon letters atop the four-story full-service Edwin Long Hotel. Just off the lobby and on the inside were a formal dining room and a coffee shop as well as a, the basement-level College Inn banquet room capable of feeding 350 diners at the same time. You think those banquet rooms didn't make money? The management promoted the popularly-priced coffee shop where guests enjoyed what they called 
delicious dishes quickly prepared. They advised motorists, follow the red neon sign. And they did into the 1960s. The building continues today to house modern banking operations. For decades, saloons serve meals and drinks to male clientele in cities, towns, villages, and rural crossroads throughout America, like this one in Joplin, Missouri. Although National Prohibition shut down public sales of alcohol in 1920, many of these venues alongside the highways survived on income from food sales until the national experiment in banning beer, wine, and liquor ended in 1933. By this time, the surviving country taverns had become known widely as roadhouses. And in time, they prospered along some stretches of Highway 66. There were lots of places to buy liquor and beer in Gallup, New Mexico, even illicitly during National Prohibition. Part of the trade came from locals, some from people passing through, and much of the balance from American Indians residing on nearby reservations where no alcohol could legally be purchased. The community gained a reputation as a place where motorists needed to take extra care to avoid collisions with inebriated drivers. Among the many bars in the city, one frequented by many out-of-town travelers was El Corral. Part of its business stemmed from its location at 1109 East Route 66, directly across from the impressive El Rancho Hotel and many well-heeled guests. An on-time customer remembered, you could get your steak at El Rancho and then you could go to El Corral for the rest of the evening. Its ambiance with low lights, a 20-foot long bar, and a smooth hardwood dance floor also contributed. Entertainment became a real draw. They always had good music at El Corral, the former patron reminisced. Most nights there was at least a local performer or group, though frequently the entertainment came from farther afield. A band from Los Angeles might be traveling through or might have gotten off the train to spend the night in Gallup and they would be playing, he said, adding, if you wanted to drink and dance, you went to El Corral. The establishment opened as a cafe in August 1944, but within three years it switched to become a combined bar and grill. By the early 1950s, steak and chicken became its featured dishes, with shrimp and lobster joining the menu by 1956. The night spot continued serving food and drink to regulars and visitors, even as newer watering holes attracted larger audiences. Finally, the last owner of El Corral, John Delgado, closed the doors in 1969 and its liquor license transfer, transferred to a newer eatery elsewhere along Route 66 in town. Soda fountains predated automobile use by several decades and were already popular resorts for those seeking cooling, non-alcoholic drinks and ice cream specialties. Because study of chemistry was part of pharmacists' training, they often were the only people in a community who had the technical expertise to create both fizzy carbonated water, H2O, artificially infused with carbon dioxide, 
as well as mechanically produced ice using very basic vapor compression ice making machines. These abilities enable them both to mix bubbly sweetened drinks and to freeze ice cream, to which many enterprising druggists added preparing toasted sandwiches and other light meals. And what a delight. One of those soda fountains, this is in South Pasadena, California. Wonderful. <laughs> Customers seated themselves on stools along counters or at nearby tables or booths. Eventually, the majority of the pharmacies in the nation featured these soda fountain lunch counters as adjuncts to their prescription and merchandise sales, with other similar lunch counters being added in many variety and department stores. Although pharmacies and variety stores sold merchandise to customers of all races, the great majority of their soda fountains remain preserves for whites only. In 1945, Mrs. Bessie Brown, with a sister and two brothers, both of them World War II military veterans, traveled to Bloomington, Illinois. There, the African Americans attended to family property matters and dropped in for a meal at the fountain at the downtown Woolworth store. The party sat ignored for 25 minutes until the white manager informed them that blacks were not served in his store. Now mind you, both of these boys had been in the service. Mrs. Brown retorted, pointing out one brother wearing his army discharge uniform and the other his honorable discharge pin. Nevertheless, None of them received food inside the Bloomington Woolworth store. When motorists began driving the Mother Road in the mid-1920s, there was one and only one company that offered uniformly high-quality meals along the highway's full length. Starting as a purveyor of food for train passengers, this was the firm founded in 1878 by English immigrant Fred Harvey. In collaboration with the Santa Fe Railway, his trackside eating houses fed travelers during 30-minute meal stops while employees fueled, watered, and changed crews on steam locomotives that drew the trains. By the time that motorists began their trips back and forth across the heartland, Harvey operated hotels and food service only restaurants scattered across every state that the highway crossed. For a number of years around the turn of the 20th century, the St. Louis San Francisco Railway was controlled by Santa Fe interests. And during that time, Fred, the Fred Harvey system op began operating multiple Frisco trackside eating houses across Missouri and Oklahoma, including one in the Ozarks. The steel rails of the St. Louis and San Francisco reached Springfield, Missouri in 1870, and the town became a frequent stop for travelers. Up until 1902, rail passengers rushed to purchase food from street-side eateries around the station and hustled back to their seats before trains pulled out from scheduled fuel and water stops. In that year, a space was renovated in the west end of the existing station to house a Fred Harvey eating house. 
1926, the year Highway 66 was designated, the Frisco greatly expanded their two-story red brick station, covering the exterior in light-colored stucco and shifting the Harvey dining rooms to more space at the east end. As part of a gradual takeover of food service along its lines, the St. Louis and San Francisco in 1930 assumed management of the Springfield Station restaurant from Fred Harvey, but this was not the end of feeding the traveling public. The station and its eating house conveniently stood at 301 South Main, just one block south of Highway 66 along College Street. The reputation of the popular eatery attracted lots of motorists. Among them, Irene M. Roberti and three girlfriends who drove from Massachusetts to California in summer 1941. On July 17th, she penned in her trip diary. We had a simply grand dinner at the Frisco, our first Fred Harvey place, and also the first restaurant we found in a railroad station. We like Springfield very much. The Frisco Eating House served meals till 1955 when the railroad closed its meal operations, citing financial losses. In 1967, the last Frisco train stopped in Springfield, and a de decade later, the disused complex was raised. While some roadside food vending enterprises, like those of Fred Harvey, had long antecedents, others came into existence with the proliferation of vehicles drawn by internal combustion engines. The truck stop was one of these enterprises that sprang up to meet the needs of heretofore new customers, drivers of long distance motor trucks. Ordinary service stations could meet the needs of most motorists, but they generally lacked the larger volumes of fuel and the specialized equipment and lifts required for servicing full size trucks. This is the Dixie Trucker's home in McLean, Illinois. By the 1960s, rigs had grown so large that their drivers found themselves victims of their size, being restric restricted to stopping only at special purpose truck terminals with sufficient space to fuel up, park, and turn around. Staunton, Illinois, just to the northeast of St. Louis, was a convenient place for westbound and long distance drivers from the Chicago area to refill fuel tanks before entering the congestion of St. Louis. It also made a welcome stop for eastbound drivers leaving the city to get out of their vehicles, walk around, and relax. This strategic location helps explain why Joe Roseman chose the eastern outskirts of the town as the place to build his 66 terminal. He erected and opened this combined fueling station, garage, restaurant, and motel catering to truck drivers in 1940. John C. Meckles ran the station and garage while Estelle R. Feltz managed the cafe. The restaurant earned a reputation up and down the highway for its fried chicken. The entire complex was constructed of ceramic blocks and had a distinctive steel tower surmounted with neon reading 66 terminal. Joe Roseman's son watched construction, the early operation of the enterprise. I was made aware very quickly that the 66 terminal name meant the highway 
and the Phillips 66 brand gas that we used. Adding, I felt a sense of adventure about being on Highway 66. The truck stop in Staunton developed an unexpected source of income from buyers who drove new cars home from the Detroit factories. These vehicles left the factories with special break-in oil designed to be changed after 500 miles of use. Many of these drivers ate in the cafe and slept in the 66 terminal motel rooms while the midnight crew in the garage drained out the used oil, refilled the crankcases, and greased the fittings. John Meckles bought out Roseman's share of the business in 1952, and seven years later <coughs> expanded the lodgings with the two-story motel building. His son, John D. Meckles, joined him in the business, which served the public until 1977 after the location was bypassed by Interstate 55. Many thousands of customers stopped for food, fuel, and service at the 66 terminal on the outskirts of Staunton. Suburban tea rooms represented a class of roadside eating place very different from the truck stop, though the two evolved concurrently in the first quarter of the 20th century to meet surprisingly similar needs. Tea rooms, often on the outskirts of cities, offered white women affluent enough to drive their own automobiles picturesque hideaways where they can enjoy tasty light meals in the quiet company of friends. Often these eateries doubled as meeting places for social clubs and similar organizations. They remained popular into the 1930s, but the Great Depression forced most of them to close or convert into more prosaic roadside cafes. Cyrus Avery, known as the father of Route 66 because of his instrumental role in promoting the creation of the cross-country highway, established one of these rural retreats. He owned farmland on the northeast side of Tulsa, where in 1921 he erected a Tudor Revival style combined service station, tea room, and tourist cabins named the Old English Inn. Five years later, when Highway 66 was officially designated, it passed right by this roadside enterprise. Its tables became a popular destination for white ladies from Tulsa and surrounding communities seeking a quiet, respectable place to dine and visit. It operated commercially from the 1920s until 1943 when it was removed to make way for a traffic circle to handle increasing Highway 66 traffic. Almost as soon as people started driving automobiles, clever entrepreneurs set up schemes to attract them as paying customers. One way to accomplish this was for servers to take orders at the cars, deliver prepared dishes to the vehicles, and collect payment at the car windows. Drug stores and lunchrooms may have been the first enterprises to offer this curb service. But businessman J.G. Kirby in 1921 established what expanded to become a chain of pig hip drive-ins based on barbecued pork sandwiches. More followed. Curb service restaurants 
blossomed on the West Coast during the 1930s, with California becoming known as the eat-in-your-car restaurant capital of the nation. Even so, it was William L. McGinley who invented and in St. Louis perfected and popularized what became ubiquitous folding trays that waitresses known as car hops hung on the outside of windows to hold food and beverages while customers ate, dined, and fumbled for change as tips. Drive-in restaurants sprang, sprang up across the United States, but the one that traces its roots to the mother road is the still prosperous Steak and Shake founded by Gus and Edith Belt. It began in 1934 as a filling station with a small kitchen in Normal, Illinois, but grew from Gus's belief that people would pay 10 cents rather than a nickel for a hamburger if they knew that its patties were ground from steak cuts of beef rather than from fatty waste. They placed meat grinders in plain sight so much customers could see the cuts of meat going into their hamburgers. From the outset, the couple hired young men dressed all in white to carry food to their customers as they sat in autos. Based on curb service and quality ingredients, steak and shape drive-ins spread across the Midwest and in later years, much farther afield. Their historically significant original store building still stands alongside Old Route 66 at 1219 South Main Street in Normal, where today it houses a Monocle's Pizza Parlor. Each region in America fostered the growth of regional food fashions, from steakhouses in cattle country to fried carp dinners on Fridays in rural taverns across the central Great Plains. One of the most distinctive eating institutions in the Midwest was the Supper Club. And these institutions enticed many Mother Road travelers. Supper clubs were night spots where white middle class people could find pleasurable combinations of food, alcohol, music, and dancing. Depending upon local liquor laws, customers either brought their own hard beverages or imbibed mixed drinks prepared by bartenders. Most common in the upper Midwest, Supper clubs abounded around Chicago and as far to the southwest as St. Louis. Large numbers of lobbyists operating in the Illinois state capital created a, con a setting conducive to whining and dining. So Springfield, Illinois supported a number of these enterprises. The Mill Supper Club in that city began its existence as a grocery store adjacent to a large Pillsbury flour mill that later gave it its name. Owners Lewis and Herman Cohen saw greater possibilities than food retailing as national prohibition ended. When they sold their l &H grocery business in 1933, they opened a tavern in the same space that attracted couples seeking food, entertainment, and drink. With menus that in time tempted diners with charcoal broil, filet mignons, lobster tail, and lamb chops, the enterprise expanded and expanded. Eventually, it could seat 500 diners. The routine in a supper club was for patrons to arrive about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and in a cocktail lounge be offered drinks and appetizers. 
They then moved to tables in a dining room for a sumptuous supper. Next, they either returned to the lounge or moved into a separate entertainment area for a live musical review blended with the intervals of ballroom dancing. Many of the establishments also offered game rooms for those inclined to wager. Such venues made it convenient for well-heeled Route 66 travelers to enjoy nights on the town if they were so inclined. Wanda and David E. Punch celebrated his safe return from the Korean War by heading to the mill. When Herman Cohen learned about their special occasion, he announced to the guests that the club would be closing early at 11 o'clock, but he asked the punches to keep their seats. By the early closing time, the wait staff had departed, but Herman, the orchestra, and the punches remained. It again doesn't want to advance. And we want to. I'm so sorry. Herman, the orchestra, and the punches remained. The place is yours, he told the couple. Order up and dance away to your heart's content. They had the band and the giant dance floor to themselves. Many Springfieldians and old-time Route 66 motorists had their own particular memories of the mill, which operated until 1971, burning a year later. As I conclude today, let's reflect on all the many windows that allow us to view and comprehend past events that shape the places where we live and work. Food gives us just one of the many ways to understand better the experiences of past people. Thanks very much. Okay, as we do the questions, I'll be repeating them so that our Zoom audience can hear them too. Any questions? Okay. So Dr. Baker, do you have a favorite spot along Route 66 where you'd like to, because I know you've traveled along the route, uh, or maybe within each state that you might enjoy best? That's not an easy <laughs> question. Okay, so let me, let me just repeat that for our Zoomers. The, uh, the question was, does he have a favorite spot that he likes to travel to on Route 66? Yes. West of El Reno, Oklahoma, there's about a 25 or 30 mile stretch of 1930s concrete pavement, two lane pavement with a low curved curb on each side, which was designed to uh, channel rainwater and snow melt. Uh, they were known as suicide curbs because they also prompted cars to flip over. But it is the finest unaltered preserved section of historic Highway 66 pavement that you can drive for mile and mile and mile and mile and mile without modern intrusions. And I always go out of my way to uh, uh, drop up to the old road on the far west side of El Reno and drive that concrete stretch of pavement. Okay, next question. 
how far could the cars at the time go? And like, you know, it, as far as how quickly they had to refuel as opposed to how quickly they needed to eat a meal or something. Okay, so for Zoomers, the question is, um, what was the difference between the range of a gas tank versus the range of the stomach? Okay, uh, I've driven Highway 66 both directions in a four-cylinder 1930 Ford automobile. Uh, about 85% of the historic pavement is drivable, and uh, it happens that I've, I've owned and driven these cars since I was a teenager. And I, you know, I, I don't think that much about it, but I have indeed driven the historic two-lane in the type of vehicle that it was designed and built for. And uh, uh, a Model A Ford has a 10 gallon gravity feed fuel tank, which is uh, located uh, at what you would consider to be the dash of a modern car. Uh, you're, you're sitting with the gas tank in your lap. It's right below the windshield and the gasoline flows in by gravity. There's no fuel pump. And uh, uh, it's a 200.5 cubic inch four cylinder engine with pistons about the size of quart oil cans. It's incredibly inefficient. Uh, I've, I myself have never got better than 16 miles to the gallon in a, in, a, in a Model A Ford. And that means that the absolute range of the car is 160 miles. Uh, I typically stop and put in fuel uh, when it gets below half a tank because I don't, gas stations are not as frequent today as they were in the past. Uh, but theoretically, you could drive 150 miles on a tank of gas. Uh, the car was designed for an America of gravel roads. So the engine, transmission, and differential were all engineered for people to drive at an average speed of about 35 miles an hour because you don't drive over 35 on a gravel county road even today because you lose control. I mean, the, the car's designed for a gravel road America. You know, I went to school at Texas Tech. It wasn't until 1936 that the first paved road reached the Lubbock. You know, think about this. So you're going to be you're you're going to be averaging 30, 35 miles an hour. Uh, if you want to have a, a 300 mile day, you're going to have continuous driving 10 hours. Does it does this sort of help? Uh, I also need to say because these are really crude vehicles. They constantly shake. I mean, you're going down the road and you're shaking like this. this I'm not exaggerating. Uh, the, uh, uh, the suspension system is boogie springs, transverse springs. It's a rough ride, little itsy bitsy narrow tires, large diameter, little tiny tires. You feel every crack where there's an expansion joint on the concrete. The thump, the thump, the thump, the thump, the thump, the thump. The thump. <laughs> And after about an hour, I get out and just walk around the car so I can stop shaking. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm truly serious. You find a safe pull out, and I'll, get, I'll walk around the car a couple of times, get in there, and shake some more. It's fatiguing. So people look for opportunities to take a break just to get away from being beaten to death. You know, it's mechanical steering, mechanical brakes, everything, everything is... Other than the little four-cylinder engine up there going pop 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 pop, your it's it's your own human muscle power. So it's fatiguing, and they didn't you know they didn't even come with heaters. I mean, they did not come with heaters. Uh, you could buy aftermarket accessory heaters. Uh, they didn't come with defrosters. You had to buy an aftermarket. Uh, piece of glass with bare wires and four suction cups to put on the inside of the windshield so that you could melt the ice on the outside of the windshield in front of the little rectangle. <laughs> Does this sort of help? This was not driving in a modern rental car. 
which I've also done on Highway 66. Totally different experience. Okay, we've got another question. So with all that said, then these folks that were actually driving all the way from Illinois to California, like how many days have they been on the road? Okay, so Zoomers, we have a question. For people that were driving from Illinois to California, how many days was that trip? Uh, the distance is roughly 2,500 miles, and uh, it depends upon it. If, if, if you wanted to make a trip like that, you'd be like Viola Von Covering. You, you, you know, she went with her, with, her, with her father in 1934 in one of these four-cylinder Fords. It depended upon how many hours between two drivers that they could manage to keep going before they just they, they wore out. They had to, had, to, had to find a tourist cabin somewhere or maybe one of those county seat hotels. Another question? Uh, yes, ma'am. I just first want to congratulate you uh, for your preparation. It was very pleasant to how you synced what you were saying with the images. It made all the difference to look at the pictures while you were explaining everything. So thank you for that because I know it takes a lot of work. Well, I, I, things together. I need to give a real credit to uh, the uh, uh, Library of Congress Office of War Information Photograph Collection, uh, which uh, is merged with the Farm Security Administration Photo Collection, because many of the uh, many of the generic images, like in the Supper Club, uh, are from the Office of War Information, uh, the federal government, and the images are available online at the Library of Congress. Now, the individual photographs of places that I came up with one way or another, but uh, the generic black and white images are from that extraordinary collection that you can sit at home in your computer and browse. So I, I really commend that to you. Okay, for the Zoomers, the question is, what was the path to his passion for this topic? And a second part to that is, where did he find the journal entries that he was re referencing in the presentation? The, the, that's a very thoughtful question, and, and I appreciate it. Um, when I was 16 years old, before I had a driver's license, I bought my first car, which was a four-cylinder 1931 Ford. And for my entire life, I've never been without one. Uh, I've always had at least one four-cylinder Model A, uh, sometimes several. So, uh, right now, I've got a couple of them. And uh, by driving a vintage automobile, I became interested in the roadside environment and uh, attempt, have attempted to understand that environment. Now, now we'll skip ahead several years. Uh, after, I, after I went to school at Texas Tech, I worked for a decade uh, at the Panhandle Plains Historical Museum in Canyon, just south of Amarillo. So I live just south of Highway 66 in its very, very last years. Uh, much, most of it by that time had been replaced by interstate, but there were still sections that were, were US 66 from, you know, from the uh, New Mexico state line west to Tucumcari was the, the very last stretch that, that uh, interstate did not replace in New Mexico. So uh, an interest was reawakened. Now, I, I'm a historian of Texas. My books deal with one, one thing or another in the Texas past. Then, maybe 15 years ago, 
I came to the realization that when I lived in Amarillo, I was seeing the very end of a historic event. And that was the operation of the corridor of consumption that Highway 66 created across the country. And uh, that I'd been part of it. And at the time, I was too close to realize the significance of what I was experiencing. So about 15 years ago, I determined to um, write a book about what it was to eat one's way across the country. And uh, uh, the research strategy was to undertake the most distant and most expensive research first, which meant uh, Illinois and California, uh, both of which are, are you, you've got to, if you're going to spend a, a week at the Huntington Library in San Marino, California, you, you, you're going to save your, save your money so you can get out there. Um, uh, spent about a week at the downtown Los Angeles Public Library, uh, Pasadena Public Library, uh, Mojave Desert Heritage Association in Goffs, California, where I found some of the richest interviews with people who lived and worked on the road. Uh, so I began at the ends and I began working my way in all the time looking for either people who could share their remembrances with me as oral interviews or who wrote their, others had interviewed, uh, there were interview transcripts, or had written memoirs of their, of their travels. And I particularly sought out those memoirs because they provided a human face that otherwise wouldn't be there. Uh, it's one thing to talk about the history of the Club Cafe. It's another thing to share Lou Cofton's 1952 experience as a solo motorist going in there and having a meal. And having a family of travelers concerned about her. So that's how it came about. In the process of this, I, uh, uh, in Illinois, I went to the Lake County Historical Society, which had the uh, archives of the old Kurt Type postcard company that was the largest postcard publisher in America. And I'd seen that they had uh, about 40% of the production files for postcards from the mid-20s up into the, about 1960. And uh, I made an appointment to spend a week there working in those production files because the finding aid mentioned that it had correspondence from cust postcard customers and the original black and white photographs that customers had mailed to Chicago, to the postcard company, so that the artist could create color postcards in the years before the invention of color photography. No other historian had ever asked to work in the production files. And I discovered a treasure trove of heretofore unknown original black and white photographs that became the grist for a, a, a different book on Route 66 but it's by going to the places where the records survive. Don't think that the internet gives you access to everything. No one had ever even opened those big 11 by 14 envelopes of those production files since the company closed. My eyes were the first to see those photographs. You've got to go the sources. Absolutely. Fair enough? Okay, and we've got a Zoom question now. Oh, you're right. I'm um, did Route 66 incorporate any part of the 1916 to 1920 Bankhead National Highway, or was it entirely separate? Oh, this is a great question. Uh, the, before 1926, long distance highways in the United States were named they were named. 
And it happens that in 1916, uh, Senator Bankhead of Alabama introduced legislature uh, in the U.S. Congress for the federal government for the very first time to provide states with matching funding for the construction of highways that would link cities together. This was the first ever federal government contribution to highway construction. And uh, he became so revered across the country that uh, local promoters designated a highway from Washington, D.C., where he sat in the Senate, through Birmingham, Alabama, which was his home, through Dallas, El Paso, Tucson, to San Diego to create an all-weather road. Uh, now, this was a mostly gravel road, but an all-weather road that would dodge south of snow in the Rocky Mountains and be open the year around for driving. And it was called the Bankhead Highway. And it passed through Fort Worth, Dallas, Texarkana, El Paso. Highway 66 was completely north of it. It went from Chicago to St. Louis to Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Amarillo, Albuquerque. So U.S. Highway 66, which in New Mexico, Arizona, California, was on top of what was known as the National Old Trails Highway, another of these named roads. So it was completely north of it, and it did not overlap the Bankhead Highway anywhere. Good question. Okay, any other questions before we get to the book signing? All right, I think that we're good, and those have been great questions and a fantastic presentation on a historic road. Thanks to all. This has been a treat.